Um, hi everyone, my name is Mona Schubert. I'm assistant curator at Foti Museum Winter Tour in Switzerland. And thank you all for joining us for today's panel discussion, um, which is called Exposing the Unexposed, Feminist Collectives and Street Photography. Um, before we hop into the topic, I would like to just inform you a little bit about the technicalities. So the stream will last around one hour. And for those of you in Zoom, um, your microphone should be muted already. And if not so, please go ahead and mute them now. Um, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the discussion. So if you have any questions for the Q&A or throughout the live stream, you can write a message uh, in the public chat or send it directly and privately to my colleague, uh, Lucinda Grange, who's also here in the chat and she's gonna monitor them. Um, the event will be recorded and also archived. So if you don't want to be seen on that recording, please um, do not activate your camera. Um, and now I would like to hand over the word to the director of Photo Museum Winter Tour, Nadine uh, Wiebliesbach. Thank you very much, Mona. Uh, this uh, conversation, this panel discussion is taking place um, because we are obviously very interested in, um, ver in presenting various practices, um, especially when it comes to street photography, because right now in Winterthur, we have a show uh, titled uh, Street Photography, um, 70 Years of Street Photography. And the curator of the show is Sabine Schnakenberg, which is also responsible for a private collection in Germany. And this private collection is by FC Grundlach. Maybe some of you heard about him. He's a very known collector. And what is really interesting is that he collected over the past um, almost 40 years, a lot of um, very influential photographers, a lot of, let's say, big names, known positions. And for this show, Sabine Schnakenberg um, combined um, a lot of, let's say, more contemporary photographers to create um, five, in the previous show it was seven chapters around um, different aspects of street photography. So usually when we install a show or especially when we develop projects ourselves with Team Photo Museum, we pay very close attention to um, diverse practices. We, are, we find it very important that also known um, and not so known um, female or human beings who identify as female are more present in our programming. So when we installed um, street life photography, it was clear that um, there is a huge lack of representations happening. But as for a lot of different shows, um, this can happen also with um, sort of a historical focus because practices are just also curatorial practices, they differ um, from person to person, but also over time. So yeah, we are very excited um, for this to, to, to be able to um, have this conversation public um, together with practitioners from yeah, pretty much all over the world, from two very different um, places. Um, and I would like to yeah, say thank you to begin with. Also, I know Moshe is um, installing a big show, like you must all be very busy right now. So thank you for taking the time. Before we now hop into the discussion, we would like to ask um, each panelist to introduce themselves as well as their practices. And uh, we're gonna start with um, Julia Coddington. Um, so thanks very much for the museum for um, asking us all to speak and um, particularly Mona who made this happen. Thanks also to Moshe for um, helping us to get um, Double Trouble exhibited um, as part of Head On. So I'm based in Australia, in New South Wales, in a small coastal town. I've been shooting street, I'm a street photographer, but I do dabble in other um, genres of photography. I've been shooting streets since the late 2000s um, and more seriously since 2015. In uh, 2017, um, I co-founded the Unexposed Collective, along with my colleague, Rebecca Wiltshire, who is listening with us tonight. Um, and and um, we both despaired about the low representation of, of women amongst the um, street photography, in the street photography genre. 
Um, so we decided to start Unexposed Collective as a, it's sort of, it's called a collective, but it's a rejection against the norm of the traditional collective where it's all inclusive. We decided to make it um, inclusive of all, all gen genders, um, but we decided to only feature the work of female um, non-binary and intersex street photographers. Um, so it, it, the idea is to be all inclusive, but um, provide a safe space and um, build a community for female street photographers. So Unexposed, since it started in January 2018, has become that. It, originally, it was based in Australia, but early this year, we opened it up to um, international members uh, as part of COVID, and we had a lot of interest from international street photographers, so we decided to open it up. And then uh, just a few months ago, we decided to start two branches of Unexposed Collective, Unexposed South Asia and Unexposed Australasia. So Unexposed Australasia um, is run by um, Linda McLean and Susan Brunielti, um, and Rebecca and I are assisting them. And then Unexposed South Asia is um, co-founded by um, Debrani Das, who's based in Kolkata, and Rebecca and I helped Debrani with that. So the aim of, so Unexposed Australasia is already sort of its own group um, because we had a lot of those members already from the Unexposed Collective, but Unexposed South Asia is a new group. Um, it's a particularly um, important group, we see it as being a safe space for women in a um, very male-dominated genre, particularly in, in South Asia. Um, it's to build, it's to educate, to build confidence, and most importantly, to build community in South Asia. And Debrani will tell you more about that um, when, it, when she gets to speak a little later on. Um, and we just had great success with um, both the branches, um, Unexposed Australasia and Unexposed South Asia. We um, were one of 10 printed exhibitions at the Indian Photo Festival in Hyderabad at the moment. So it's, a, it's a, an exhibition of diptychs and it's a collaboration between the two new branches unexposed Australia and unexposed South Asia. So we're very, very happy about that. And um, a lot of our South Asian members in particular are very thrilled that they're part of that festival. So thank you, Mona. Okay. On to the next person. <laughs> so the next person is actually Debrani. So Debrani does, she would also like um, tell you a little bit about uh, the South Asia um, part of Unexposed Collective. Hi, Debrani. Hello, Mona. Uh, thanks to Photo Museum Winterthur for organizing this panel discussion. And uh, thanks for having me. And thanks a lot, Mona, Lucy, and Nadine for organizing this event. Okay, so yes, I am a, one of the co-founders of Unexposed South Asia. And uh, you know, Unexposed South Asia is the region and we have many countries in it, like India, Bangladesh, then Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Nepal, Afghanistan, Pakistan. I think I'm not missing out anything <laughs> here. So yes, uh, this much countries are included in South Asia region and we have very, very less number of women street photographers from this region. You know, there are many uh, differences here. Like we have some cultural differences and we have language differences and there are class and caste systems also. And you know, some social economical differences. So because of all these differences, I think we have uh, very, in, uh, very, very, very much lower women street photographers than other part of the world. So yes, we uh, build this uh, South Asia, uh, this unexposed South Asia. And uh, recently we got selected in uh, India Photo uh, Festival, uh, which is a great step and this is a great success because we have just started it's been only three or four months 
so yes we are very happy about this thing <laughs> yeah and uh, well uh, and uh, i'm also a member of street eye collective and uh, admin of world photography forum and recently i have joined uh, we the world magazine as an editor in their photographic section and lastly i want to add that um, uh, i have uh, recently won the artist residency uh, in new york city uh, which is uh, done by uh, women street photographers uh, curated and founded by gulnara samoyliwa so this is something unique i think uh, i have never heard of any artist residency for any uh, street photographers maybe there are but this is uh, something i have never heard of and i'm happy to win uh, this uh, artist residency for sure and you know uh, to tell more about uh, anexpo south asia because uh, we are focusing on women collectives so here i want to point out that uh, women need huge confidence you know and in this region maybe sometimes they are not uh, willing to come forward and maybe there are some lack of confidence and just to build up this community this uh, new community we are hoping and trying to engage women photographers from this region to build up their confidence more so yeah that is from my side thank you mona thank you so much debrani giving this short insight. Uh, the next petitioner is um, Anchika Varma. It's day, evening or night, <laughs> depending on where you are. Um, it's lovely to be here. And again, thank you so much for the Museum Winterthur, Nadine, Mona for reaching out and Lucy for helping put together, you know, the entire talk that we're going to have today. It's, uh, it's wonderful to actually be in the company of Julia and, and Debrani and the rest who you will listen to, uh, to talk about solidarities. And, uh, you know, it's been mentioned previously as well, but I think that solidarity building within photography is so layered because um, there's so many times that you need a, a community to fall back on, not, not just for practice, but to just find safe spaces. And I realized that I needed the same when I was, and I am still a photographer, but when I started with photography uh, myself, I started with street and now I, I kind of work more on long-term projects. Uh, a lot of my work actually deals with kind of trying to dissect uh, personal, collective and, and mythical histories. So uh, I am a bit of a history buff, but I like to make my own histories as well, you know, uh, sometimes in the work that I create. Um, and I find that it's in, I mean, for me, my interest is definitely interest, uh, there in the intricate relationship between memories and objects as, as markers of identity and how we uh, choose to belong to certain communities or not. Uh, with this in mind, in, in 2018, I'd actually started Offset Projects. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, I guess, it's an initiative that, uh, through which I'd hope to uh, create uh, conversations around photography, around bookmaking uh, in specific, uh, but to also take photography outside of photographers and to see how we are responding to visuals and how we are reading visuals today as, as a community and as, as people. Um, uh, at Offset, we organize uh, regular workshops, we have residency programs, we uh, do artist talks that have been more prominent owing to the pandemic since uh, the other programs have not been so plausible uh, during this year. Uh, but one of the other things that we do organize are curated pop-up reading rooms. Um, it's been uh, very, very overwhelming to see people respond to photography and to open our own minds around what we create and how we see uh, what we create. And I hope to discuss more of that and learn from, uh, from the panelists today on that as we proceed into the talk. Thank you so much, Mona. Ooh, I was on good timing, it seems. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so thank you, Anshika. And uh, the next uh, practitioner coming up is um, Kimberly Wallace, who uh, works under the pseudonym Kim Boyd. Hi, Kim. 
Hi, thanks so much for having me. And um, thanks to all the panelists. This is uh, an amazing array of talent on this panel tonight. It's, it's quite an honor to be here. Um, so my work is focused on commuters as they travel uh, into the city of Melbourne in Australia, it's where I live. And I've been doing this for about seven or eight years. Um, I'm really quite fascinated by the microcosm of what public transport is. It's the one uh, underlying factor that no matter what socioeconomic background you come from, your culture, everybody uses public transport. But this, this thing happens in Melbourne where everyone becomes completely self-focused um, and and withdrawals within their own minds or within their phones and no one looks up to see what's actually happening. And I'm quite fascinated by that. So I try to capture those stories um, and those images that I see every day as I'm commuting myself in and out. Um, I joined Unexposed Collective a couple of years ago. Um, I met Julia um, and it was really a collective that I did not expect. Um, and that's because it is such a sense of community and it really nurtures photographers no matter what level that they come from, whether they're very experienced or they're just beginning their journey. Um, and I've met and come across the most amazing women and who have such talent who otherwise wouldn't get a voice. Um, our society is very male dominated. There's a lot of industries here within Australia and you know globally that are very male dominated. Um, and the, the collective gives an opportunity to women to come together, share skills, um, experience, you know, everything from the practical side of art making through to production, technical skills, you name it, it's there. Um, and it's been invaluable in my journey over the last couple of years. I've learned so much from these women um, and I will continue to do so. And I think community is the really strong bit and the bit that the street photography industry as a whole really needs to get better at doing that, to get that inclusion of women, particularly as women get older um, and are further in their lives. Confidence level is really difficult to move into something, particularly art, because it, you know from the outside it can feel quite judgmental. Um, so we need to nurture that and unexposed in particular is um, fantastic at the way that they've approached it, particularly with social media, because in Australia we are, you know, can be thousands of kilometres away from us, uh, from each other. We're a very large country, um, so we've, it gives us the ability to meet others that we wouldn't normally meet. Um, so unexposed has just made such a massive impact, not only to my life but um, to the other members as well. That's me. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, next one coming up is uh, Shvita Agarwal. Shvita? Hi, hello everyone. Thank you so much Photo Museum to make, us, to, to make me part of this. And I'm really grateful to be in this panel. And I'm a photographer. Uh, I started street photography in 2013. And I, I started a project in 2017 called Project 365 where I used to shoot daily. And I was part of Everyday India, which is a great uh, uh, collective uh, of India. And I was like, one of the curators. So I, I, I was the first woman to be the start the collective of my own, which is called Hardcore Street Collective. And I started in, in end of 2017. And it grew very fast because it, it's a platform to, you know, showcase the best street photography around the world. It's international and global, and it gives a platform to all the street photographers to showcase their best street photography. So yeah, that's about me. Thank you. So yeah, uh, I also wanted to add, we also showcase the uh, best uh, photographer of the day, daily, like, who are not very famous in, in, in the social media, but, but has very good work. So I, we also show that. Thank you so much, Vita. And last but not least, least it's um, the next panelist is Moshe Rosenzweig. Um, Moshe, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Okay. I have to preface this. I'm not a woman. So, and I don't <laughs> identify as one, but this is a joke. So, um, 
First of all, thanks very much, uh, Mona and Nadine and uh, Lucy for uh, running this session and all the other panelists. Really interesting to, will be interesting to hear what uh, everyone has to say. Um, I want to say also thanks specifically to Julia and uh, Rebecca. We've been working with them closely this year. And with Julia, we've been working for the last three years or so. The, um, I, I, want, I don't want to sound uh, difficult here, but I don't have interest, specific interest in women photographers. I'm interested in good photography. And what we do with the festival, we choose good work and we choose with no names. And what happens as a result, we end up with a lot of women photographers, probably half and half. So we don't actually do anything in particular to promote women photographers. We just promote good photography. And this is an acknowledgement of how much good photography is being done by women. And without doing any special sort of work in order to get this work into the festival. So I'm very happy with that. Um, the festival, just very briefly, there, there are some pictures here of uh, where the this specific exhibition, the, um, the unexposed one is in, but very briefly what the festival is like. Uh, it's been running since 2010 as a festival. Before that, since 2004, for the first six or seven years of, uh, of it, it was just the one competition. The competition is still very much part of the festival. We do, uh, these days we have two sections. One is portrait and landscape. We give away $70,000 worth of prizes every year. So it's very significant. Large chunk of it is in cash. Um, the, we select the work, um, this is the work from the, for this exhibition, specific exhibition. Uh, we select the work, as I said before, with no names. This is very important to us. And the people on the selection panel are made of photographers, curators, uh, gallerists, people in the, basically, in the industry. And this one is actually done deliberately. We have both men and women and people from different backgrounds, cultural backgrounds. We try to mix as much as we can so the end result is that we get nice selection of work without trying too hard, basically. Um, so what else did I want to say? Um, look, there's not much else that I, 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 it will come through the conversation as we go, but in brackets, I would say, I would recommend or invite everyone who's watching, um, to submit the work when we do the call for submissions. We'd love to see more work. The more we see, the better the festival is. And, and obviously, you know, we would like to engage with as many photographers from as many different backgrounds um, that we can, can, can get access to, because this is what is, well, first of all, interests me is to, to see new work and to give voice to people from different backgrounds. And I think this is somewhat similar agenda to many of the people who come to the festival. They want to see new and exciting work and not the same old, same old over and over again. So that's it for me for the moment. Before we go into the conversation um, and a few very good questions, um, we've prepared, I would also like to um, add a small footnote. <clears throat> I'm, as, as, as being part of an institution, I would very mu much wish that in the future, um, we are gonna able to have um, selections like blindly and to have like in the end, a good balance. But as, as our team and myself is being part constantly of juries in art schools, um, in other environments. And the problem is not that they're not enough or not interesting enough um, practitioners who identify as female. 
it's the fact that a lot of them are not feeling empowered enough to send in their documentations. So maybe this just something I really hope, uh, Moshe, that in maybe 10 years, 15 years, um, we really gonna be in the position where we know that there is enough people feeling um, addressed to send in their work. Uh, so, don't yeah. get me wrong. I didn't, I didn't say this as any uh, criticism. I'm just saying we are lucky that we get, we get the material. And I see the need for encouragement uh, for some people because some people don't feel either empowered or, or uh, um, strong enough to stand up and say, I, I do this. And, and sometimes we need, especially organization, uh, bigger organization need sometimes to actually push, push these people forward. And I think what you have done today with this this uh, seminar, I think, is actually highlighting this and maybe give this idea or promote this idea within other organizations as well and, and encourage the participants, the photographers, to actually feel more confident and, and send the material to, to these organizations to, to choose from. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, to take, to take their space. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to hand over to Mona now. Thank you. So after this short introduction round and also like the positioning of the different institutions, I would like to hop into um, yeah the discussion in general and um, yeah now I mean we are almost already like in there. So what I would like to start with is maybe thinking a little bit about why female identifying street photographers are not equally visible. And I think what's really important here as well is maybe also to look um, at the um, yeah topographical context so maybe um, we could start I would suggest to start maybe with the Indian street photography scene because for us it was really important um, especially in the context of our own show to open up to different um, areas and cultural backgrounds so um, yeah maybe um, Shvita I think it would be really interesting um, yeah maybe also what you said because you were just telling me you were also the first um, yeah, women to start a collective. And um, as you were saying, um, Hardcore Street Photography, you were founded in, I think, 2017, right? Yeah. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about how this came along. So initially, I used to give a lot of time to it. And I used to highlight famous photographers and show their work in stories and constantly showing good work, you know. So not people got connected to it, you know, and they started, you know, taking interest in Hardcore Street Collective. And uh, I used to highlight a lot of uh, photographers who are not very famous also, but they, are, they have exception work in social media. So the, our platform was very good way of, you know, uh, showing in Indian and international both in globally, like. Uh, I don't find uh, very few, uh, I don't find collectives who, are Indian collectives who are showcasing internationally. So we are the first few, uh, you know, collective to show it globally, which really impacted people and, you know, they showed interest in that. Yeah, and I think like for me, just when I was thinking about your collective, what I found really interesting or like speaking of empowerment, I mean, you had two young women hosting yeah. this as co-curators. So I think that's also oh, important to know, right? Yeah. Other than me, there is Smriti Chakravarti from Singapore, who is one of the curators. And she, she plays a great part in it. And she does great job in curating and, you know, showing good work. So we, we both get along very well. And, you know, we both uh, are in same line. We have same vision. So in future also, we are planning to have some exhibitions or, uh, or we launch a book. We don't know. Let's see. Hoping for the best. Um, yeah, and then maybe just because speaking of books, so I was, you were also telling us that like the social media platform is quite important to you, but I also know that like books um, can play a significant role. That's also why I would like to uh, maybe ask um, Anshika. Thank you also, like, thank you, uh, Shita, for like. Thank you so much, Mona. Um, yeah, maybe I would just ask like Anshika to add to this because I think what's really important to see is that there are different platforms um, right. different active platforms also in India who have um, international impact. Right. Uh, I think Shweta is uh, really right in saying that we don't see many uh, women 
practitioners and I, you know, within street photography for sure. And I've always questioned that myself. I mean, I started with street photography in, in many ways. Uh, and, and today I've kind of moved my own practice into more long term and, and maybe a different kind of an engagement. Uh, but, you know, when we talk about uh, collectives, and I think this is something that maybe is more a question than, than a resolution, uh, Mona, is, uh, you know, like there are different formats of collectives that have existed as well. Um, you know, there are collectives where you create work together, but then there are also collectives that become safe spaces in many ways and that allow you to look at your own work very differently sometimes. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm digressing and if I am, please steer me back, <laughs> you know, into a conversation. But I think when we talk about the idea of being a collective, um, it's, it's because you need a, a space where you can share your thoughts, where you need a space where you can experiment and know that there's someone who's kind of going to uh, be able to be very honest with you, but also encourage you in the right direction. Uh, you know, um, it's, it's very interesting. I'd actually like to mention um, uh, the Kali Collective, which is actually based in Bangladesh. And uh, it's, it's very interesting for me when I see them as a group uh, together, because they're all practitioners of different mediums in, in many ways. Uh, they deal with photography, but they have different genres of photography that they follow. And what's been amazing is that for them, uh, they, the sharing of the experience of what they practice has actually helped them find different voices in their own work. Uh, you know, and then their collectives, of course, like Shweta is saying, which is, uh, you know, encouragement in, in a very... Uh, tangible form uh, which is either on social media or actually having group exhibitions together uh, for me what the uh, the amazing thing about collectives is the possibilities of conversation that they can uh, introduce one to uh, you know and and in that case it may be even the act of having uh, a group of, of women or, or not just women together but to question why we're doing what we're doing uh, and I I find that as as a really important step that that solidarity and that place of trust to exist is extremely important for us to also make photography what it can be. Uh, you know, um, there are different practices even within, within the larger genre of street, uh, some that over a period of time and questioning and understanding um, have become critical in how the photographer approaches the street. Uh, you know, all together. And, and maybe if these conversations had not come in from a safe space, maybe street photography might still have uh, the larger, I mean, it still does to a certain degree, but the, the notions of representation and the notions of practice would have been very different if these conversations would not have started at any place. Um, I don't know if I'm really answering or, or helping this conversation right now but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know. thank you um yeah i think like the one um, important aspect that you kind of stress um at least for me is this um idea of um yeah collective action like empowering each other discussing the work and um yeah also trying to um create platforms and um yeah that i think like might be a good time to speak about like this idea of, of unexposed collective of just trying to create two platforms and two very different topographical contexts so um julia and Devrani might i mean this is like going into your direction maybe also yeah. um kim um yeah i was just one maybe you could also tell us how you like sorry and she <laughs> do you want to tell sorry, us something? i i did no, I just wanted to say it was really nice to hear Devrani talk about um, the fact that it was South Asia and not just India. I think we, we begin to fragment more and more and to hear Devrani say that it was, you know, unexposed in South Asia was actually looking at it, India, but also Pakistan, Burma, you know, Bangladesh, Nepal. It was really nice to see that because I find that idea itself a collectivizing and it's, it's, it's a bit of a political act right now because we're in, in a time when, you know, nation boundaries are kind of 
pretty hell bent on separating us a lot. So it's really nice to also see collectives emerge that that want to blur those boundaries. That's that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Anna. Yeah, maybe also that's the aspect of this like transnational organization. Maybe I also framed this kind of wrong in the wrong way. Um, so. But I was, would still like to talk a little bit about this um, idea of these different notions of like either the collective, which sometimes also has this like collective authorship. So it's this one framework and um, everybody steps a little bit behind. But what I think it's really interesting about the unexposed collective that you find community through like individual practices. Um, yeah, maybe, uh, I don't know if Debrani or Julia, if you want to add something to that. Um, I. I mean, I don't know how it relates to individual practices. I mean, we're all street photographers. Um, so I, I was initially involved with um, women in street. In fact, I'm still involved with women in street. And that platform has been responsible for really building up the representation of women in street photography. And two, two years ago, um, there weren't as many women street photographers around as there are now. and and the reason there are so many more around now is because of Women in Street and um, Unexposed Collective, and there are a couple of other feminist collectives around as well. Um, so, you know, they're, they're actually having quite a big impact and um, quite ex exponentially. I don't know, Shweta, have you seen, have you seen um, a rise in representation of women street photographers on your platform? Yeah, I have. Just in 18 months, probably. So it's, it's, been, it's um, been quite remarkable the, the, the impact that these groups are having on giving, just giving women confidence that, you know, that's the big thing is we're showing, showing their work, um, their confidence is increasing, they're also getting a lot of education. A lot of women go um, and do street photography workshops. They're, they're really into educating themselves. Um, the other thing that we're trying to do um, on the main Unexposed Collective and, and a little bit on Unexposed South Asia as well is getting people to have conversations on that platform in the Facebook group about particular street photography issues. We find that women in particular really hold back uh, um, having discussions on social media about particular issues. Um, on platforms that are mixed genders, it's often men that dominate those conversations because there's kind of this one upmanship and women really hold back uh, doing that. I don't know if the people have noticed that so much. But we're just starting to have more conversations to, again, build people's confidence around having, um, having a voice, not just through their um, images, but also um, through com having conversations. And Debrani, you might want to talk about a little more about that as well. Yeah. Thanks, Julia. Okay, so uh, before founding this uh, Unexposed South Asia, uh, there was uh, no female-oriented uh, collective in India. So I know I am from that era where there was nothing like that. And I know what is the difference now we are making, we are trying to make at least. So, uh, you know, in Bangladesh, there are uh, many, uh, not many, I mean, there are very few female street photographers. And... They have told me that uh, it is very difficult, very, very difficult for them to be a woman street photographer in Bangladesh. You know, life, some, every place not easy. I mean, uh, Bangladesh is quite a different in culture and they have some other ethics and all. And their life in Bangladesh is very difficult. And in India also, women street photographers are there but they are not visible that much. In fact, before founding this collective, I didn't have any idea that there are many new street photographers, female, who are working very, very hard and they're producing brilliant work. And I'm happy to see that they are the part of now this exhibition in India Photo Festival. 
and 60 women photographers are showcasing their work, uh, exhibiting their work there. So there are many new faces in that exhibition. And this will definitely boost up the confidence of female street photographers up to a certain extent. That is for sure. Um, Giovanni, can I like, just hop in on that idea? So I was just wondering, maybe you could also point out how you and um, Unexposed Collective, how did you get in touch? Because you told me that you met through a workshop. Uh, uh, no, it was not a workshop. Not I a met, workshop, okay. No, no, I met Julia and Rebecca uh, for an uh, interview. Uh, it was a video interview for, I think, a woman in street. I, am I right, Julia? Yes. Yeah, so it's for women in street. And in 2018, we, we met. And from there, we started to build up a very strong friendship between us. And somehow, we, uh, I think we connect at a point where we, we know that this thing is very much needed. And Julia and Rebecca, they are my seniors. And I have learned how to, uh, what is the responsibility of being a senior photographer? So... Uh, I'm happy that uh, I'm a part of. You are our equal. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. But yes, I have learned these things from you and Rebecca. So I'm happy to part of uh, this uh, collective. But yeah, my ma my main objective is like I want to see the new talent. They are uh, feeling more confident about their work. They are feeling more confident to submit somewhere. You know, sometimes it happens that they feel like, uh, okay, it's okay. Uh, I don't have that much of uh, work. I, I can't uh, submit here. So this, this is the lack of self-confidence. You need to find that confidence within yourself first. So this is, I think, uh, my main objective here that I want to see more female street photographers into, uh, into all festivals and uh, to all competitions. Uh, so that's it. <laughs> and definitely we want to make, make a uh, women uh, community where women feel more secure and they are more open up about their issues or they can share their work, ex experiences, opportunities. So it's like a home, home and safe place for them where they can discuss and open up about anything. Yeah, so I just mentioned also, Mona, that um, we decided, so Unexposed Collective is open to all genders, but we only um, feature the work of non-binary and insects photographers, but with um, Unexposed South Asia, we decided to make it specific to females. So with that group, only women can join that group at the moment. Devrani, do you want to explain why, why we decided to do that? Yeah, because uh, in South Asia region, uh, uh, they are not very much comfortable till now uh, with the um, non-binary and intersex uh, photographers. I think uh, it is a right decision that uh, we are doing. We are adding only female street photographers uh, for the time being. But uh, maybe later we can... Uh, think that we should but uh, but not in uh, but not now right yeah there are many many cultural differences here and we we don't want to hurt any cultural sentiment in any country and in any photographers also so we are just focusing right now for the only for female street photographers um, yeah, I would like to like hop in on that note because I think that's quite interesting because on the one hand you're of course like um, having this platform for female identifying photographers but then you have this kind of restriction so I was also wondering maybe we could talk a little bit about like um, maybe photography as a privilege in general maybe that's also something to keep in mind so I think we already tried to um, discuss uh, the problematic of this binary approach somehow so um, I was wondering, maybe we could also talk a little bit about, um, yeah, what kind of impact could also feminist collectives have on this like ethical or cultural um, questions in the sense. So I just know from our discussions, we were also talking about um, within like the Indian photography scene um, that there also are differences because picking up photography is also not 
too easy, right? Um, so speaking about uh, the educational infrastructure, for example. I mean, uh, it's interesting that you, um, I mean, you, you started with education, uh, you know, to a certain degree. And um, I think that's, that's a space that's been uh, fairly non-existent uh, in, in India, at least with regards to education within photography. Um, we've slowly had some institutions, I mean, again, Bangladesh is, um, has been kind of like our, our Mecca because of uh, Patshala, which is, you know, a, a, an amazing institute that uh, has been started by Shaidul uh, and I think has been the resource point for pretty much every practitioner uh, within South Asia. And, uh, and now we actually have uh, the uh, photo circle, which is based in Nepal, that also looks at photography practice. And they've collaborated with, uh, with Pachala in Bangladesh as well. In India, um, education is still fairly fragmented. We do have a few state-run uh, institutions and a couple of private uh, universities that have started engaging within photography. Uh, but I think a lot of what we learn about photography and the history of what we learn, uh, you know, whether it's the gaze of photography or whether it's the practice of it, is, is fairly embedded in, uh, in a colonial history. And so uh, that begins to definitely have an impact in how photography is practiced even to a fairly large degree. Uh, I'll include myself in it, you know, because when... and. Uh, for most, I'd say, photographers, we start out with a camera and you get an internship with a magazine or a newspaper or, or you don't and you just keep walking the streets and, you know, kind of seeing what catches your eye. And the reference point that one does have uh, when you're young is to look at books that might be available to you. Um, largely, these books are by uh, Western photographers. And I don't think there is a problem as such in a Western photographer, but the problem is with the gaze of an outsider and the encouragement of the outsider's gaze. Uh, you know, um, honestly speaking, if I'm if I'm walking down the streets of of a uh, village, uh, I'm as much of the outsider as as the Western white male or white female who's walking into the same neighborhood because I come with my own uh, own baggage of of, ex of privilege. And uh, I think what's really needed is, is for us to start breaking those down, those barriers down and start actually engaging with, uh, with street, but also with any format of photography from that perspective. Um, I think also along with, you know, the, the act of, of education, uh, privilege in photography has also come up and maybe this is why we have more male photographers than female, uh, just, just to put it out there. I, I'm, it's not an answer, of course, but is that photography and street photography has always been associated with this idea of a testosterone-driven you know, perspective and movement. And, and it's, it's really saddening to actually see that because, um, I, I mean, for me, there is no like male gaze or female gaze. There is an individual's gaze. Uh, and, that's, and that's why um, I feel that even as we're making collectives defined by, by gender or, or they should, I mean, in India, we've now actually over the last couple of years seen a resurgence of collectives that are not necessarily gender based, but that are more ideology based. And that's obviously reflective of um, a larger political movement happening in the region, but you actually have uh, minority voices kind of collectivizing very strongly. And that could be, as, as Devrani has mentioned, that there is um, there are a great many dividers that you know we have historically constructed that we are now trying to break out of. So you actually have uh, groups of photographers. Uh, there is uh, something called the Unclad Collective, who are also on Instagram, and I'd, I'll write these names down on the chat as we move forward. And the Unclad Collective is actually just, it's an Instagram page where they're working around the taboo of nudity and sexuality in, in photography. But I think photography becomes a means of addressing larger taboos in society. 
uh, a very strong collective actually that I would I would encourage you all to maybe you know uh, subscribe to or go visit is uh, they're on Instagram um, as Her Pixel Story and it's a collective of female Kashmiri photographers largely photo journalists who are using their practice to have their own voice be present in the larger narrative about their own land and their own identity. Uh, so, you know, these are all ways of alternative education for me in, in some ways, because I look at this and I find out that even within the street language of what I've, I've seen when I was younger and sometimes very often what I practice, uh, I'm forgetting the regional photographic language. Uh, and it's very refreshing to sometimes see this because uh, their parameters of, of what is a good image is, is so dependent on a completely different range of symbolism and metaphors that they read through, you know, in their photographs. Um, so, yes, I think for me, it's, uh, I, I know this conversation is about uh, collectivizing as, as, as female identifying, uh, but I've, I feel like the fact that we need to talk about this is also very reflective of uh, the fact that while we need to kind of collectivize and find our strength in each other, there's so many groups that also need that. And, and if we could all in some beautiful utopian ideal world get together, uh, you know, uh, God knows what photography could do. <laughs> you know? Oh yeah. Thanks for sharing this. I mean, um, I can just add to that from my own perspective because this year I've been working uh, very closely with um, Tuma Collective from Myanmar and it's especially that because they are focusing on storytelling aspects. I also encourage everybody to check out their um, Instagram account and their work which is super important for the region there. And what they also are recently introducing the same way you were like translating here of course in the Myanmar context was that they were introducing this documentary photography um, workshop. So also because there was no... Um, yeah, in the sense like um, educational infrastructure, they just started providing that themselves. And this is not um, focused on um, like female identifying participants, but in general to encourage the photography scene or like um, also making their own knowledge available. And I know from like a conversation with uh, Julia, for example, they are also doing like unexposed collective as well as doing lots of workshops, um, also trying to encourage um, open up the access to street photography. Um, I also can share the Tuma Collective later on if anybody's interested uh, to check them out. Um, I think also like some, I saw some familiar names within this chat. Um, maybe um, also if anybody wants to add something, I'm very open to that. But I think this also leads to another aspect for me. I was wondering um, um, about this idea of in which context are you able to actually present your images or how can you make them accessible? And then like that also leads automatically to this idea of um, sharing resources. And I'm not only speaking about like this, of course, education is also a resource for me, at least that's how I would frame it. But I think also like financial resources, shared spaces, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, that's actually a question I would like to, um, yeah, to open up to the whole group. If, if I may, uh, you know, bring in offset at this point of time. Um, this was something that we realized that the conversations around photography uh, were very closed in and were also extremely privileged because to be uh, a participant uh, or, or a student of a photography course was, was very expensive since within the country it was really difficult. And I think at the same time also photography today has become a medium and a language, not just for the practitioners of the medium, but for readers and audiences of the medium as well. And, and actually Offset started in 2018 uh, by constructing these pop-up libraries and reading rooms. Uh, over the years I've been collecting uh, photography books. Um, Mona, we actually do have Tuma's uh, uh, books as well <laughs> in the library. And, and the idea was to actually give people this, this space that they could come to and have a one-on-one -on -one engagement with a medium uh, created by practitioners who um, were really trying to find their own voices with the medium and then to see how that echoes 
Uh, so one of the things that we started doing at Offset was to do these curated pop-up um, reading rooms and we would take them to schools, we would take them to universities, um, design and photography based, but also a uh, larger academia where we're engaging with students studying, studying anthropology or sociology even. Uh, and we also started showing these in larger community centers as well uh, with, with the idea that this could become a way of understanding the world that we occupy and what happens if you do not kind of initiate a formal education into how one reads images but you allow um, instinct you know to respond instead and we would follow these reading rooms by uh, by actually collective reading sessions every day where people would spend some time and, and look at a book and then we would actually discuss it it was our own book club, but I guess it was a photo book club, you know, uh, and that was, it was very, um, it was actually really interesting to see how people from different uh, backgrounds came together into one space who might have something to do with photography or nothing at all, and how they began to interpret the images for themselves. Um, we'd done uh, an exercise, which was a book making exercise earlier this year where we actually um, asked people to, um, we kind of carried uh, about two weeks archive of newspapers for, uh, for a workshop. And we asked people to kind of literally read through the images that were presented to them in newspapers and create a book out of their response to those two weeks. Um, just to give you guys a, a little context, these were also the two weeks where India had been having the surge of a people's movement um, against uh, fairly fascist uh, policies that were being proposed to be implemented, uh, extremely divisive policies. So you could actually, and for me, the concern was how do we begin to engage with photography um, and look at photographs for how they can even be manipulated you know, in, in some ways. Um, and so people actually made their own photo stories or photo essays in some ways uh, by creating collages out of images that they'd seen. Um, and uh, I mean, it's, it's quite interesting if, if we forget about photography and then look at the photograph again, uh, it's a very interesting exercise. And I think street actually is, is a great uh, genre where that engagement comes through as well, because um, it's, it's something that I think Devrani had mentioned in one of our previous talks which, when, when I was saying, how do we define the street today, you know? And, and she'd mentioned that it's about looking for that magic in, in some ways. Um, and, and maybe she can actually elaborate on, on that a little bit more. But I think, I mean, this is just uh, something that I wanted to immediately kind of talk about in terms of education, uh, you know, that's outside of photographers but still very important to photography because very often we don't realize how our images are being understood or accepted or interpreted in, in many ways. I find it really interesting this, uh, what you're talking about, because a lot of the times talking to photographers and talking to the public, this, this a little bit of disconnect of who we are, what's our voice. And in this, in, in the context of this conversation, what our strength and right to actually say certain things and there's a lot of discussion about who who is allowed to say what about whatever subject can i talk about something if i'm not part of that community which is quite limiting at times and sometimes i want to hear the, the, the opinion of people from a different group anyway so i think it's what you are describing the the, the work that you've been doing with some people i think it's fascinating i think it's it's kind of getting it back to the core question of what the work is and how we read the work and how other people read our work, which is sort mm -hmm. of the three elements that, that make an image at the end of the day. It's, it's what the story in front of the camera, what's the story that the photographer is trying to tell and what the story that the audience is actually reading in the picture. Uh, I was in, a, in China in, a, in Pinyang in a festival and we had a conversation about looking at images. And I remember one of the comments there was that the visual language is universal. 
and the and it was all kind of in the the idea was we're all the same we are living in a big village and you know we just telling stories different stories but it's all the same language and it was really interesting to see how different we read images and construct images and read images that it's based which based on on culture on language on on you know political sort of environment a lot of um, elements that they uh, influence and i think this is something that's really important i think this is partly possibly the role of a uh, organization and and collectives is actually to to open this question i think what's happening tonight is actually part of this process of engaging with other people and other perspective and question our own our own biases i suppose to how we look at at, at different material that comes from different uh, backgrounds you you're so right mushi because I think so much of how we read or understand images is so dependent on our understanding of our own mythologies and our own histories and how we look at symbology so much, uh, you know. And and it's interesting that you didn't mention this because it's something I'm always conflicted by. Like, is photography a universal language? Because it seems that one, in in certain cases, it might apply, but but in most cases, it it begins to kind of create this varied pool of understanding and i feel it's nice to actually celebrate that to celebrate that the same object or the same material or the same reference could mean so many things to to people you know spread out all over mm -hmm. the world um but yeah thank thank you for for saying that um so Unfortunately, the time is running out a little bit and I would also like to uh, hand over the word a little bit to our audience. Um, maybe if anybody of you has specific questions um, about the collectives or one specific practitioner, you are able to um, put them down now in the public chat. So I'm just going to like check, um, I think so far. Otherwise, I would just like go ahead and also ask one question myself. But yeah, maybe, so maybe then also maybe oh, sorry can, sorry <laughs> maybe i can uh, i can add in um, a question which uh, uh, we think is equally important when it comes to practices as the sort of the process itself um we were also looking at different um models of how collective work uh, sort of turn like turns out into an output other than visibility um, and maybe you can talk a little bit about what is the economical side of um, you being sort of organized in a collective? Because I obviously know, or I can at least assume that as individual photographers, it's very different or there are a lot of different models, but maybe you can talk um, just briefly about how you are organized also from a financial point of view. Um, well, we, we don't, we're just um, a non profit non for profit not even a non for profit we're just a group of um, people with who are like minded so if we need to um, have a, if we want to put on an exhibition then we have to raise money for that so the way that we um, did that, the double um, double trouble exhibition was we asked people to, to pay for their um, print print costs with the double exposed exhibition unfortunately that was a free exhibition um, that was um, courtesy of the Indian photo, photo festival um, that that's the problem we have is um, that you know if we want to exhibit our work or if we want to make a book anything like that we have to ask people for funding that um, is also the beauty of social media is that you know we can exhibit work um, online or on um, our, our social media platforms and at the moment um, as we saw with head on we were able to exhibit our work um, online and a lot of people have been doing that um, a lot of collectives have been doing that as well 
So and do you sometimes get out like commissioned jobs out of being um, pre presented like that? No. Not, not, <laughs> not yet. Okay. Not until now. <laughs> um, I have another question from the audience I would like to hop on to. So it's actually two by... Um, uh, Indumati, I hope that's pronounced right. So she was wondering, um, because we were talking about female identifying artists and um, Julia, you were briefly also telling us that um, Unexposed Collective um, is also featuring intersex and non-binary people. And she was just wondering, because right now there are just female photographers up in this discussion. Maybe you could also elaborate a little bit on how that came along. And then the other part would be, um, that you would like to hear some more experience of from the Indian practitioners from their everyday practices. But I would maybe also start with like first, like this kind of um, beyond the binary, like gender question. So maybe Julia, you could, could you like elaborate this a little bit? So why don't we have um, non-binary and intersex representation? Is that what you're asking? Or in which way, or how did you choose to represent them? Like how does this show how in your work? Well, we, they um, contribute to the community in the way that other people do. And we, um, there is, um, there are a couple of non-binary photographers that we know of. Um, and there, there's an intersex photographer that, that is quite active in the group. Um, and they... Uh, you know, they just, they have the same sort of representation as anybody else in the group in terms of having their work shown. I mean, it depends, it depends how often someone contributes to the group and how often they, um, you know, they post their work. Yeah, and then the other part was also by the same person. So this would also be addressed to... Um Shita, Devrani and Anshika, um, maybe you could also speak a little bit about the challenges you face every day as a female photographer in India. Shita, do you want to start? So I would like to say that uh, personally, I didn't feel any challenges. I felt like uh, when, I, when I was joining photojournalism, my parents were quite reluctant of, you know, why am I have to join photojournalism? What is the use? Why you have to do, you know? So families, you know, don't, uh, they don't uh, allow, you know, to go into photography or they feel it's not that good professionally. You know? And other challenges is the fear of street photography. Like you have to go, go close to the people, you know, and shoot. So there is a fear of, you know, shooting people. They like, they have this idea. What What do you think, Dev, Devrani? They have this fear of, you know, shooting people closely. We have to go close and, you know, shoot. Yeah, so, maybe yeah. because uh, being a female photographer, I, I have never bothered about, I mean, going close. I love to go close to people. So that is not the, something that, uh, uh, I mean, I'm concerned about when I'm in street. I, I'm telling about other photographers, like a lot of people say, you know, I'm, I have fear of people, you know, yeah, yeah, what yeah. they will think. And yeah. I also don't feel any fear, but generally people have this fear that, you know, yeah. how will generally they, they go have. Yeah. Generally and they in have. street, especially it's, you have to go close to the people. And you know, I know, I don't know, being a female photographer, I think <laughs> I feel lucky to go, go close because they feel more, uh, good about that a female street photographer is going close to them rather than a male photographer yes. so, right huh? yes I agree. Uh, I'm not able to hear you you're not as threatening yes <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah they have confidence you know they have this trust that we will not do anything wrong or yeah I think that, that they can overcome by practice, I think. But uh, yeah. being a female photographer, I think the challenges I, 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 I have to face, like, uh, you know, uh, sometimes I like to shoot in night, uh, but uh, it is not possible for me to go alone in night for a shoot. Uh, night means after 10. <laughs> so 
my parents get worried my husband gets <laughs> gets worried so you know that is the thing sometimes uh, it is like uh, some part of if i feel uncomfortable in some street or um, in some specific areas then i try to avoid that otherwise it's perfect for me okay, and then maybe I like i do Sorry. No, no. I, I mean, actually I wanted you to talk to her. I was like, and she can't wear you. Great, right here, Mona. Uh, no, I think I did want to agree uh, and add to what Devrani was saying. I think the, uh, you know, there is always a hesitation in whatever format of photography that we do choose. You know, whether one wants to um, stand very close to the subjects or observe from a far away distance. I think those are personal challenges that can. i think are are fairly universal for people who do pick up the camera and and you know decide to follow with it um for me i the the struggles and the challenges are more institution uh, based and and social based uh, like they brani mentioned um you know um uh, wanting or deciding to photograph at night they i mean i wouldn't even say this is night but there's a project that i've been working on which um, actually looks at a forest land that's in the middle of the city um and it was really weird because uh, i decided to walk in with my camera and start photographing this forest uh, which is now a protected site and the guards of the forest would actually look at me with great suspicion and they won't let me into the forest alone because they said we can't take your responsibility because you're a woman who's going in alone and uh, and at the same time if you're a woman who's going in with a man you're not allowed because they don't trust um your morality or they would like to impose their morality onto you so i actually had this whole conversation with this guard where i said so if i go alone then you're scared because there isn't a man with me but if i go with a man then you're scared that i'm walking into an empty space with a man so who's you know at what point do i start navigating this and when do i actually begin to focus on what i want to photograph instead uh you know and uh, it's it's very unfortunate but i think it's also important for me to put this out you know uh, at the same time and and maybe devrani and shweta might remember this um even uh, the lady who asked the question i i believe she's also from bombay uh, a few years ago we had an incident in bombay in in mumbai yeah, um, yeah. where uh, there was a female photographer who was sent in on an assignment uh, to photograph um kind of like um, an isolated mill uh, you know we bombay has a history of uh, these mills that sustain the city and they've now shut down which has become a great ground for people to do fashion shoots or even you know kind of photograph there in general and she had gone with a male friend of hers who was uh, which was decided by the institute the magazine that she was uh, sent you know um, by for the assignment um and there were a bunch of men who were extremely drunk and rowdy who um, sexually assaulted this woman because they were aghast at her audacity to enter a mill with a camera accompanied by a young man uh, you know these are very everyday i mean these are very real everyday incidents and in fact this is from a very metropolitan city i mean I I can't even call my experiences as challenges because I come from such a place of privilege when I started working with a newspaper um, our deadlines I mean there were no deadlines we were pretty much in the office till 2 in the morning or 3 in the morning till whenever was needed and the first thing that I had to learn to be a photographer was to learn how to drive you know was to learn to have my own car uh and it's it's ridiculous because then i mean how many women do have access to that uh you know uh, i'm living in a city and i had um and my mother was you know extremely generous and said yes this is what you need to do uh but it's great pressure on any family to think of the possibilities that might exist within that um uh, you know following the same zone one and i'm trying to kind of learn how to drive to be able to photograph and then when i'm in the office the photo editor was not comfortable with me with him taking the responsibility for my photographs so i was relegated to a desk job and i mean i had the profile of a photographer um i was a features photographer but for a big chunk of my time i was just sent to the desk to look through archives 
uh, because he did not want to take responsibility of what might be possible uh, if I were to step out and take a photograph. I mean, it's not that scary a proposition, you know. Uh, if everyone around women can actually begin to uh, take responsibility for themselves, but it's something that for some reason we are meant to be accountable for. And I think it's those everyday challenges, the assignments that you don't get to go for, uh, the travel assignments that you do take up to realize that you might be traveling with a gentleman who um, thinks he can be inappropriate with you. Uh, so for effective reasons, very little of it has to do with photography, but everything has to do with photography because that's that's the work you know that's what we know to do that's that's all we know to do so it's you know they are very real challenges at the same time um unfortunately like i have to wrap it up a little bit because we are yes. already a little bit over time um yeah so this leaves me to thank you so we would like to thank you for sharing your perspectives on this topic i think we also uh, managed to talk a lot about different aspects um, as Nadim was speaking of empowerment we were also speaking about different visibility in each of your photographic scenes which also needs to be a plural um, other collectors also fighting on the forefront of this um, yeah endeavor if you can say so so that's only leaves me to thank you very much for sharing the perspective and it's also really important for like for the winter tour to have like this um, conversation tonight also as an addition for the show, as Nadine mentioned. Any Thank last you words? Thank so much, Mona. <laughs> I think we, we ended with a very grave ending, so I'll, I'll hand it over to someone else to <laughs> add something positive as we take off. But thank you, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this panel. It's been really wonderful. Thank you. And also what I wanted to mention, I forgot, so please um, feel free to reach out to the practitioners. They're all on social media, they have their Instagram accounts and websites. Um, please follow them and support them. Maybe like you can also collaborate with them. And if anybody also in the audience is a street photographer, looks for a strong um, yeah, collective to partner up with, you have many faces now you can connect with. I hope this is also helpful. And I, I will uh, add also what I mentioned before, if anyone in the amongst the audience is interested in uh, sending us material, we'll be very happy to, to look at it and, and consider it to exhibit next year in the festival next year. And also, I will be in touch with the other people as well. I'd love to work more with, with, the, with the other people on the panel as well. And the experience with Julia and Rebecca has been so good that I just, I can't resist saying, you know, I hope that every next one will be just as good as, or, you know, it would be fantastic. And the show is fantastic, by the way. I didn't, I didn't say anything about the work, but uh, th this work is absolutely phenomenal. There was one slide there that you could see. It's it's in, in a beautiful space outdoors, and it looks, it's exactly the right location for it. And uh, apparently there are 70,000 people going through that space every week. So it's quite, uh, it's going to get a lot of visibility as well. And I'm really glad because the work is so beautiful and very well curated as well clever so, thank you so thanks thanks for for the museum thanks mona it was nice to also to to get this one developed from a, almost a chance meeting last year in in uh, greece so yeah i know <laughs> <laughs> okay so yeah thanks everybody and i'm just like thank you so much mona enjoy your uh Hi. day afternoon and night i guess for the australians <laughs> to keep through and power through this at a very late hour so very bad. thank you so much yeah thanks. thank you thank you, thank you. Bye. thanks everyone bye bye, bye.